Okay, we're going to be in Ephesians 4.31, Ephesians 4.31 this morning, and we're going to expound on that. We've already exegeted it. Ephesians 4.31. But before we begin our Bible study, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. It's a time to use 1 John 1.9 if needed. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's bow our heads together for a few moments, and then I'll finish us out in a group prayer. Our Father God in heaven, we're delighted to have our freedom and be able to come together as Christians without persecution. We're praying for our men and women in our military around the world who are fighting for that freedom. We pray you build them up, encourage them, enable them to neutralize our enemies wherever they may exist. We pray for our police men and women here inside America that you would encourage them and protect them. Enable them to apprehend the criminals who seek to destroy our freedom stateside. We pray for our leadership in America that you would continue to raise up men who could guide our country by its constitution and thereby protect our freedom. We pray for our friends around the world, especially our friends in Israel, Father. We pray that they would have a renewed sense of patriotism and that... Uh, Father, if it is the rapture generation that these citizens of Israel will not only recognize that you are uh, their chosen nation, but that Jesus Christ is, in fact, their Messiah. We pray for our friends uh, in Korea, the people of Ukraine. We pray that our friends in the Philippines, the ones in ministry, you would enable them to carry your word wherever it may be wanted. For our friends on the prayer list that are sick, we pray that you would heal them, whether it be by medicine or by miracle. For our friends who are in pain, we pray that you would relieve their pain, remind them of your grace, which is sufficient. For our friends who have lost loved ones, Father, we pray you be with them in their grief, remind them of your precious promises, which brings the peace that passes all understanding. We thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name, amen. We had began uh, studying in Ephesians 4.31 and I was reminded uh, not too long ago that I had spent two years in Ephesians 4 teaching only 22 verses of Ephesians chapter 4. So if you think, man, he sure is going slow, look, I go slow the whole time. Well, you're not going to miss one point, I guarantee you. You're going to get it all. So, we're looking at Ephesians 4.31. I'm going to read it in my New King James. It says, let all bitterness, and we saw that was all categories of bitterness. Be put away from you, that's including wrath, anger clamor, and evil speaking with all malice, and that's all categories of sour grapes. And so we began to look at, uh, last week I drew you a, a picture of how sour grapes grow in the soul. And uh, Hebrews tells us, don't let a root of bitterness sprout in the soul. And so we began to look at the garden in the soul that a lot of people grow. And, you know, gr uh, grapes love to grow on trellises, so I'm going to draw a trellis here inside your right lobe, your cardia. And so we saw the first sprout of bitterness, which was anger, wrath, malice, uh, violence, and there's the sour grape cluster 
that you're growing in relation to the sins of anger. And then we grew another sprout of bitterness, and this one was jealousy uh, and envy and covetousness. And you grew a, another sour grape vineyard over here, and this one was uh, self-pity and self-effacement and uh, downtroddenness. So you can have all kinds, of, you can have a full garden of sour grapes growing in the soul. And the Bible warns against these mental attitude sins which sprout up. And we saw that the roundup that you're going to spray on these sour grapes in the soul is Bible doctrine. You've got to learn some biblical truth and you've got to get rid of those uh, the sour grape clusters in the soul. So we began to look at the two cosmic systems where you become under the influence of Satan's system and uh, you develop these sour grape clusters in your own soul. So I'm going to take and go back and do a short review. And we're going to look at the cosmic dinospheres. Now, if you didn't know it, uh, the reason these are named cosmic is because the word world in the Bible is translated from the Greek cosmos. And when you see the word cosmos, it's an organized system. So, who is the god of this world? Well, Satan is. He's the prince of the power of the air. And this is his world. And so when you see the cosmic systems, what you're seeing are two satanic systems of thought that can invade the, even the believer's mind so that while in this world, you may be headed to heaven, but you may have wrong thinking. And so we're seeing the cosmic dinospheres. First of all, we're seeing cosmic one. It's the arrogance complex of sins. And then we're going to look at this morning, cosmic two, the hatred complex. Let's take a quick review here before we begin looking at the hatred complex. Both dinospheres, that's a sphere of power of the cosmic system, exploit your bad decisions. Now remember, the Bible is the source of all good decisions. If you really want to make great decisions in life, get in line with the Word of God. The Word of God is your owner's manual for life. You have a life, learn how to run it. Bad decisions, imprisoning you into a labyrinth of satanic deceit. By definition, a dinosphere is a system of power in which man is influenced by power greater than himself. God designed one dinosphere, that's your spiritual life, to bless man. Satan invented two dinospheres to enslave man. You cannot change these three designed dinospheres, or three uh, dinospheres. You can only recognize their existence and choose between them. The divine dinosphere, that's God's system, produces winners in life. The two cosmic dinospheres manufacture losers. There will be losers in heaven. So, what does Satan use the system for? He uses the cosmic system as, first of all, the vehicle for administering his rulership of the world. He is the prince of the power of the air. He's the god of this age. And this is his system. Secondly, he uses it as a classroom for the transfer of cosmic doctrine to man. 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2 mentions the doctrines of demons. Thirdly, he uses it as a tactical trap for enslaving mankind. 2 Timothy 2, 26. And fourthly, 
a factory for producing losers. And Hebrews chapter 4 mentions those that did not mix, mix the promises of God with faith. Their carcasses fell in the desert. They were born again. They all came out of Egypt under the blood of the lamb, the Passover lamb. Every one of them was born again. But once they got under testing, they failed miserably. And God would not allow them to inherit the promised land. He brought up a new generation to do that. So there's the four reasons or four uses of the cosmic system by Satan. Now, I'm going to skip forward. We covered the arrogance complex last week. And we're going to move forward this morning to the hatred complex. And obviously this has a lot to do with our verse, the uh, sour grapes and bitterness of soul feed right into the hatred complex. This is called Cosmic 2, the hatred complex. It has nine different gates, which we'll look at. The person who chooses it spends his life fighting God and fighting the plan of God. Isn't that funny? For the believer uh, that fights the plan of God, we call it the low crawl through ground glass. It's a tough road to hoe. It's wandering around. I don't know if you've ever gone coon hunting. By the way, if you're new to Arkansas and someone invites you to go snipe hunting, do not agree to it. It's a trap to take you out in the woods and leave you. Well, I probably shouldn't have told you that. You might have grown up a little if you got out in the woods and got left. But snipe hunting is where your friends take some guy from the city and they say, let's go snipe hunting. And they go out in the middle of the woods and all of a sudden everybody turns off their lights and they disappear. And the city slicker is left. Well, if you've ever gone coon hunting, not only do you go out in the woods at night, but you run through the woods at night. And... Uh, there's only one or two guys that usually have a light. You know, they don't tell you bring a light. You just go. And so you're waiting for the dog to strike off on a coon. And you'll hear them maybe chase a coon. But finally, you'll hear the old bay dog. There's a baying dog. And he's got a special bark. And you know when you hear, the, usually when they're chasing it, it's a quick yip, yip. But when the bay dog hits, he's chased it up a tree, and it's a long, usually some big, long-eared dog. It's, oh, oh, yeah, that's old Roy. He's got one tree. And you stop, and you listen, and you pick out the location, and you, you rush towards that tree where the coon starts crawling across the tops of the trees, and the dog loses them, see. He's got to stay in the same tree the dog thinks he's in before you're going to get him. So you're rushing through the woods, and before you know it, you step into a stump hole, and man, you sink up to the thigh, and you just about break your leg and say, oh, that was painful. And then you're running along, and the green briar catches you by the neck, and it almost lifts you off the ground, and it, I've got a few scars here from those things where they catch you, and you, you, uh, the briars get you. And then before you know it, you've stepped into ice-cold water running through the woods, and you're wet, all for a coon. And uh, by the time you get to the prize, usually the coon has escaped across the branches and the dog's barking in the tree, and the coon's long gone. So it's very similar when the believer is out of fellowship and he's influenced by cosmic two, that he has a hard, hard life when he's out of the plan of God and he's fighting the plan of God in his own life. And so uh, you get the question often as a pastor, why am I suffering? And there's seven, uh, there's different reasons for suffering. We've looked at the five categories of suffering, but you usually can go back to two questions. What has been my attitude towards the Word of God? Has, is God trying to get my attention? 
Is he trying to get me back to Bible class? Is he trying to get me reinstalled and relearning and re get my spiritual life kicked back off? And so you ask yourself, well, what has been my attitude towards the Word of God and my, my spiritual life? And then secondly, is the, is the same question is, am I advancing in the spiritual life? And this is testing. And what sort of testing is it? And so uh, there's, you can suffer for doing wrong and suffer for doing right. Well, in the hatred complex of sin, when you're fighting the plan of God, God will get your attention eventually and uh, try to get you to come back home. And so you, as a believer in Christ, you're a, you can't lose your salvation and you're a son of the Most High God. You're a child of the Most High God and he wants to have fellowship with you. He wants to kill the fatted calf. He wants you to be at home and wear the signet ring. He wants you to wear the fine linen, the fine robes. And uh, he wants to kiss you on the neck. And he just can't stand it when you're in a faraway land. And so he'll do what he can to get you to come home, including the famine. And so don't fight the plan of God in the cosmic system. The documentation and function of this satanic system can be seen. We're going to look at three different passages, three different uh, areas here. John, the Gospel of John, chapter 15, 1825. I'm going to turn to it and read it. All three of these mentions Satan's cosmic system and the hatred complex. Gospel of John 15, 18 to 25. If the world hates you, the cosmos, that Satan's organized system, if it hates you, he's speaking to the disciples, but this is going to every believer in the church age. You know that it hated me before it hated you. Don't be surprised if the leftists in the world despise your conservative thought. Don't be surprised if the unbelievers of the world heckle you. And this, if you didn't know it, we're, we're, on the, we're in the ghoulie season where people are celebrating evil uh, spirits that are loose in the world. And if people heckle you for being a Christian and staying away from what they call Halloween, so be it. So be it. We don't take part in Satan's system. It says... If, if it, it hated me before it hated you. Now verse 19. If you were of Satan's cosmic system, that word world, the cosmic system would love its own. Yet because you are not of Satan's cosmic system, but I chose you out of Satan's cosmic system, therefore Satan's cosmic system hates you hates you. So don't be surprised if you're met with antagonism if you get ready to live a spiritual life. That's what it's saying. If you get ready to apply the Word of God to your own life, you may be ousted, and that's fine. Verse 20. Remember the word that I have said to you. Now he communicated it uh, verbally, and now it's recorded. A servant or slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Verse 21. But all these things they will do to you in my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. And that, that was the persecution of the religious in Israel that was directed towards the disciples, by the way. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had done nothing among them, the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen that was all of the miracles that he had done and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled which is written in their law. They hated me without cause because they were influenced by, guess what? Cosmic 2. 
the hatred complex. So there's your first scripture documentation. Now let's turn back over, way over to 1 John. You're going to have two different sections here. So obviously the religious in Israel were involved in the hatred complex of sins that led to the persecution of Jesus and also his crucifixion. And by the way, Jesus says, no man takes my life from me, I lay it down. Let's look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 9 through 11. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. Now remember that once you're in Satan's system, you can put this thing together and it will become clear to you. It will become clear to you. But all you're involved in hate. And so darkness, darkness, blackness has become clear to you. It's flowing into your soul. It's clear, see. Verse 10, he who loves his brother abides in the light. That's the bottom circle. That's your spiritual life. That's agape love. That's a relaxed mental attitude of agape love. It's freedom from mental attitude sins. And there is no cause for stumbling in him. That means as long as you're in fellowship, you can't sin. You have to use your own volition to get out of fellowship. But he who hates his brother, cosmic too, is in darkness. He's out of fellowship. He's in carnality. And he is in the cosmic dinosphere, number two. And walks in darkness, cosmic two. And does not know where he is going. Because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now Satan's classroom has filled his soul with the doctrine of demons. And he does not know why he's alive now. Let's look at 1 John 4.20. Turn over a page or so. What about the hatred complex is what we're looking at. Now this is a born again Christian, okay? He's born again. He's headed to heaven. If someone says, I love God, that means he's reached gates 5 and 6, divine dinosphere and hates his brother, he is a liar. He hasn't arrived. Then see, some, a lot of believers have a lot of hate in their souls. Uh, I tell you right now, the, the world news has gotten a lot of people into the hate complex, and they're full of wrath and bitterness and malice and anger and even compulsed to uh, violence because of what they're seeing on the TV. They've fallen into the hatred complex of sins. Not the relaxed mental attitude of agape love. Someone says, I love God and hates his brother. He's a liar. For he does not love his brother whom he has seen. How can he love God whom he has not seen? So if you think you're a mature Christian... And someone says, yes, I'm a mature Christian, but they have hate in their soul directed towards another individual of the human race. They have not arrived. This is your wake-up call. They have not arrived. So let's take a look at farther Cosmic 2, the hatred complex of sin. It's going to have nine gates. There are nine different gates, nine different areas where Satan is going to get you involved into the hatred complex of sins. I'm going to open point one, but we'll probably have to go to a diagram afterwards here. The old sin nature gate. Now God created man perfectly in the garden. But when Adam ate the forbidden fruit with his eyes wide open, he fell. And at that moment, he inherited a sin nature. I like to think that he was shrouded in a, lo a robe of light. And when that light went off, he, it revealed his nakedness, didn't it? 
And he was embarrassed. And God came through and said, why do you have on these fig leaves? That was human good. That was him trying to solve his problem of being fallen. It didn't work. And Jesus Christ said, look, here are the coats of skin. The, uh, here is an animal, and I am going to sacrifice this animal, and I'm going to show you the way I must go to the cross and sacrifice myself for the sins of the world. Now put on my righteousness. And he took off the fig leaves, and he put on the coats of skin that were made for him by the Lord. And that is Jesus Christ good. And that means you'll never get to uh, heaven on your works. You will not be there because you are good or because of what you have done. You will be there because of what Christ has done. Now, his light was still off, and he still had a sin nature. And we know that Adam and Eve copulated, and they began to have children, and he passed on the sin nature to those children. And as the human race expanded, the sin nature came with it. So let's take a, take a look at what happens here mechanically. Since the original sin of Adam in the garden, the old sin nature resides in the cell structure of the body. This means that every cell in your human body is contaminated by the old sin nature. With one exception, that's the female ovum. Through meiosis and polar body, the sin nature sloughs off that one cell. If you look at cellular division in the uh, sexual apparatus of each male and female, you'll notice that when the reproductive cell of the male splits, you have two cells, and then it splits again and you have four. But when the reproductive cell of the female splits, you end up with one. And that's because of polar body. The sin nature sloughs off that one part of the cell and dissolves. And so even when you look at the cells of the human body, the female ovum is the only cell of the human race which you can see with the naked eye. And if you look online and see some pictures of it, it's almost clear. And uh, I think it represents exactly God's thought. This is the only cell that is pure. And it's by which this cell, I will send my son to save the world. Watch this. There are 23 chromosomes in the ovum, which are free from the corruption of the old sin nature. This was the means by which our Lord came into the world without an old sin nature and without the imputation of Adam's original sin. Now, this was the first Christmas, remember? What happened? The angelic armies of heaven came down and saluted Jesus Christ as the heir to David's throne as the only legitimate member of the human race who was free from the old sin nature and able to redeem our souls from the slave market of sin. It was such an enormous event. How many times have the angels come down from heaven and saluted someone? Not many. Jesus Christ, it happened at the first Christmas. So we see the Holy Spirit supplied the 23 chromosomes to fertilize that one cell in Mary's body resulting in the virgin pregnancy followed by the virgin birth, the first Christmas. We're coming up on Christmas time. Great time to study this event. Now, the trouble is, is that you had a human father, didn't you? And when you, your father and your mother copulated, along came with your father's 23 chromosomes, guess what? Greasy fingerprints. The old sin nature. And once those two cells came together and they dissolved together, if you've ever seen any uh, footage of this, it's amazing to see uh, the science behind this. The 23 chromosomes from the mother and the 23 chromosomes from the father, they come together and that cell is fertilized and uh, they dissolve together and at that moment you have fertilization 
And from then, you've got nine months. And that cell divides once, it's two cells. Divides again, it's four cells. And over a period of nine months, those cells divide, and from the womb comes a mature baby. And at that moment, you were born physically. God imputes to that child the physical life there, nashamat, soul life. And so you have physical life plus soul life, or biological life plus soul life equals human life. But you have a sin nature intact. And that means that every one of us was born into the slave market of sin. Every one of us had a sin nature intact, and that was the home of the target for the imputation of Adam's original sin. And therefore, every one of us needs a Savior. We're, we're born into spiritual death. Are we, are we okay? Now, you don't lose the sin nature when you're born again. A lot of people believe that uh, the sin nature goes away after salvation. But my former pastor, he would reiterate, he would say, if you want to see a sin nature in action, just come to the business meeting Sunday night and you can see one. And uh, anyway, he was always uh, poking fun, but every one of us have a sin nature and we brought it with us into the Christian way of life and it is a thorn in your side. It is something you're going to battle until the rapture and you get a resurrection body and guess what? You're going to be free from it. Death or rapture. So the sin nature has to do with this mortal body and as soon as you're out of this mortal body, you're free from the sin nature. We should, we should know that every one of us have a sin nature, and that's a source of temptation. Every one of you is going to have areas of weakness, areas of strength, and we're all going to have temptation in that area as we go through our Christian lives, and they're all different. Remember that some people are tempted in the area of maybe alcoholism or drunkenness, but another person might be tempted in the area of self-righteousness or religion. So we're all different. We all have different weaknesses, and that's where we get into trouble. We try to say, oh, look how bad they are, and the other person says, oh, look how bad they are. We get to judge him one another, okay? So as long as you live, even in this body, you're going to have the source of temptation with you. That's the old sin nature. Let's take a look at some answers, though. So along with point number one, or gate one, the old sin nature, God has provided human volition. That means your ability to choose as a defense against temptation, and it's related to sin and human good. Remember, all good is not good. Volition guards the soul against temptation, pressure. So that means that you may be tempted to have an adulterous relationship, but uh, you have your own volition, and uh, for me, I look at that and I say, I'm married, and I, uh, I told my wife when we said our vows I was going to be faithful to her in sickness and in death, uh, in uh, good times and bad, until death, until my soul is removed from this body. And then I remember the Ten Commandments, and that's one of the big ones, uh, thou shalt not, not commit adultery. And so when I'm tempted to commit adultery, I have that insulation in my soul. See, I have biblical norms and standards that I'm going to apply to the situation. And wherever your area of temptation is where you have to have doctrine, see, you've got to have it already stored up so you can overcome. Now, volition guards the soul against temptation pressure. The old sin nature is constantly seeking to gain influence of our soul. Therefore, the soul of every believer is a battleground as long as he lives. Now, remember, even in Romans chapter 7, Paul would say in relation to the sin nature, That's, that which I want to do, I do not, but that which I do not want to do, I do. That was his inner battle, his struggle. Remember, the old sin nature has no power 
beyond temptation. You have to fall into temptation. See? So we are all responsible for our own personal sins. Galatians 6, 7 says, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That is the ironclad law of volitional responsibility. So it would behoove you to learn how you are tempted and where your areas of weakness are. And Paul told Timothy, flee youthful lust. That means if you're tempted by illegal drugs, guess what? Don't hang around with people who do illegal drugs. If you're tempted by crime, don't hang out with your posse who likes to go out and do crime, okay? If you're, if you're tempted to be self-righteous and look down your nose at others, don't hang around the people who are goody-two-shoes and holier than thou and love to judge and gossip and malign others. Don't do it. You see that? You have to recognize your own area of weakness. And you have to flee youthful lust and apply doctrine in, over, in order to overcome it. So let's make some final points here on the sin nature in relation to Cosmic 2, the hatred complex of sins. Satan has an inside agent in the sin nature. That's his point of affiliation, see? Since every believer has an old sin nature and brings it right along with into the Christian way of life. Now remember that this is Satan's world. He is the God of this world and he is not necessarily uh, want you to sin. What he would like you to do is fix everything up. In other words, do as much good as you can do independent of God. And so when you hear the phrase, all the good I can do, be, beware. Beware. God the Holy Spirit can lead you into the right kind of good, and that is where, who we should follow. So Satan appeals to the flesh in the production of human good. It's called Operation Whitewash the Devil's World. Sa See, Satan seeks to build a utopia on earth. He's seeking to build his kingdom. It's called Satanic Utopianism. And it is a world that is good enough that we don't need Jesus Christ. And he's going to, he's going to do it. He will execute it. He is going to build. He's continuing to build his kingdom now. And when the church is gone, it will be accelerated. Satanic utopianism. And it will be outlined with a one world government, one world monetary system, and a one world religion. And uh, the unbelievers of the earth will join in droves. So what will stop satanic utopianism? And if you read Revelation, you'll be gone. You ain't going to be here. You'll see where the judgments from heaven become, they start being poured out on satanic utopianism. And God begins to judge Satan's system. So it's not all the good you can do. It is following the leadership of the Spirit in the good that you do. Now, even a believer can whitewash the devil's world. It's called wood, hay, and stubble in the judgment seat of Christ. What is the good that you produce under the influence of the Spirit, though? It's called gold, silver, and precious stones. So, Satan appeals to the flesh in the production of human good, and he wants you to whitewash his world right now. He wants you to do all the good that you can do independent of God, independent of truth. And so that's why it's important for believers to come in and sit down and learn the Word of God before they get busy in the church. You don't put them in the Sunday school class teaching before they've had a couple of years of sitting down and learning. But there is also a second use 
for the sin nature and Satan. For certain occasions, the need to attack against Christianity or the laws of divine establishment. Satan appeals to those Christians under power lust and with a weakness towards hatred type sins. They're called a cosmic evangelist. And these people are alive and well in our world. And they teach satanic socialism. They teach hatred of conservatism. They teach hate of country. Uh, they teach hate of anyone who believes differently than you. You always know when you come in contact with these people because if you have a, a, a point that you may want to debate them on, and uh, usually if a, a believer is, is doctrinally oriented, he's going to win because he can call up Scripture and back himself. The leftist whom he's debating will uh, recognize they are in defeat. And first they will raise their voice. They will try to get loud at you. And then they will be then they will go to name calling. And then finally they go to physical violence. That's how you know you've won. So there's a time to shut it off, by the way. And uh, sometimes you just have to let the word of God stand and smile and walk away. It's not always great to out-debate somebody, especially if you're trying to win them to Christ. And I highly recommend steering the conversation towards the cross. And that's where you want to win them to. Don't uh, debate with an unbeliever about if Adam had a belly button. So, there are cosmic evangelists in the human race. They're believers. There's a lot of Christians who are under satanic influence. And uh, they will argue with you till you're blue in the face. And we're going to study a verse in, in Ephesians in a couple of years, maybe. It might be three years. Called the fiery darts of Satan. And these are the messages from cosmic evangelists that are directed towards you. So there, there are pawns in Christianity which Satan picks up and he loves to use them because they're into power and they're into hate. And he uses them as spokespersons to attack Christianity. It's just like the debate in Israel right now. Well, Israel really shouldn't uh, attack Hamas. Well, look, Hamas is nothing more than a very evil organization inspired by Satan and uh, we Americans have more responsibility for the lives that are being lost than you will ever know. Did you know that Israel won that land in the 1967 war? And do you know who promoted us giving the Gaza Strip back to the Muslims? America did. And guess who did it? A cosmic evangelist who stood up for the United States and told somebody in Israel, well, you ought to just have a concession. No, they should have bulldozed it. And if you look at the borders that God gave Israel, oh, it's astounding. They're living on a little sliver of land right now that is tiny compared to what God said is Israel. Israel runs from all the way on the other side of Egypt, all the way on the other side of Turkey, all the way over uh, to the sea across the uh, desert into Iran and Iraq. It's a huge piece of real estate. And they dwell on a tiny piece of what God says is theirs right now. So there's lots of cosmic evangelism going on right now with the antagonism towards Israel and the Jews. And I'm telling you, it's all satanic. And these people right here in the second category are the ones who are promoting these false ideas in relation to the Jews and Israel. Okay, we're going to take at least a five-minute break right here, and we're going to come back to the Cosmic Dinosphere Hatred Complex. God's alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, 
man of God might be matured, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, study to show thyself an approved workman unto God who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're looking at gate one, cosmic two. It is the old sin nature gate. There's an old Indian proverb, and I do not like Indian doctrine, but this is a good saying. The grandson came to the grandfather and said, uh, tell me a story. And he said, son, on the inside of you, there are two wolves, one good and one bad. And the grandson says, which one wins? And the grandfather said, the one you feed. And it's a perfect illustration of the sin nature. We can strengthen our sin nature by feeding it with bad volition, making bad choices. Let's take a look at the sin nature diagram. Obviously, you can't see it. It is the corruption of the human body on the cellular level. But if you were going to diagram it, you would do it this way. What are the characteristics of the sin nature? And so, first of all, we would see that every one of you has an area of weakness where you're tempted. Your temptations are not others. And you may have uh, areas where if you're a baby Christian, you may have gross sins to o overcome. And that may be a filthy mouth. Or you talk like a Marine Corps drill instructor. And there is no verse in the Bible that tells you don't cuss. But there is a positive verse that says, let your speech be with grace, seasoned with salt. So you have to refine your speech. You've got to learn how to control your tongue, the Bible says. And that's a tough one for a lot. I did it. And uh, I grew up around a bunch of pirates, so I had a lot to overcome. And, um, but you can refine your speech, and that's by using a filter, thinking about what you're saying. So, but you may, grow, you may overcome your, uh, your filthy potty mouth, and then you may move on to something else, which is uh, maybe uh, hatred or anger or maliciousness or malice, hatred sins, or you may go into a different area. So, you may be tempted in one area, overcome it it may be a gross area of behavior you may overcome that early but then you move into a new area where you're tempted and in many christians they grow they may be a drug addict they may be an alcoholic they may have gotten really down but they overcome that area and all of a sudden before you know it they become self-righteous and they begin to judge other people in other areas and so I've seen this quite very many times where uh, you, you see a person who was uh, terribly addicted get into the Christian way of life, but because they learned no doctrine, they just became a malicious, uh, self-righteous person who was constantly judging and maligning and criticizing and assassinating someone else's character because of their area of weakness which was not the same as their own so you're all Um, tempted in 
different areas of weakness and you have to know what they are and you have to be alerted when they present themselves and so if you're like I said earlier if you're tempted by doing illegal drugs you don't hang out with druggies if you're tempted by uh, criminal activity you don't hang out with uh, the gang members and things like that so we all have areas of weakness Hebrews 12 1 now in most cases you will have a, a trend in each uh, believer whether he is a trend towards legalism that is asceticism where he is sweetness and light that is self-righteousness or religiosity it's holier than thouism it's looking down your nose at someone else it's self-righteous judgment and when you're involved in legalism you you're on the downward spiral towards moral degeneracy in other words you're not you're not committing a lot of overt sins but you are self-righteous and arrogant and then you have the good old boy who is involved in antinomianism that is lawlessness and you don't have a problem spotting him because he likes whiskey and he likes rum and he did these people are involved in uh, drugs and maybe uh, what does a pirate do that's what I always like to ask pirates are antinomianists they love to fight. They love to brawl. They love to drink the rum. They love to make people walk the plank. And uh, they're always involved in uh, malicious activity like stealing and uh, trying to get ahead by doing bad. So the antinomiast is the pirate. And uh, he's the easiest one, by the way, to win to Christ. And Jesus says, uh, these people whom I'm hanging out with, no, they are sinners. And he was with the prostitutes and the tax collectors and the criminals. And they did not have self-righteous trends. It was the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the re religious group, the pious group, who he had trouble with winning. He won a few of them. But the self-righteous do-gooders were hard to win, you see. But the harlots and the tax collectors and the, the gross sinners, he said, these people know they need a Savior. And here I am. I'm right here in the, in the midst of them. You also have a lust pattern, which is the pressure outwards on the sin nature. And you know the lust patterns as power lust, we talked about earlier, social lust, Approbation lust is a big problem in the local church. The desire for approval and recognition. Uh, criminal lust. You have uh, monetary lust. Sexual lust. Uh, you have the different lusts. There's 12 different lust patterns that are mentioned in the Bible. And that is the pressure forcing or the pressure in the sin nature driving it outwards into action. But also, the sin nature has another characteristic, and it is called human good. It is the area of strength where even though you may be born again, if you're out of fellowship, you can produce good. In Isaiah 64, 6, God tells Isaiah what human good looks like in his sight. He says, Isaiah even your righteousnesses are like filthy rags. And the word for filthy rags is used menstrual rags in my sight. That's what God says about our good that's done independent of him. Now here's the problem. Human good hasn't been judged yet. And God's going to judge it in two different judgments. First of all, the believer's judgment when you and I get our evaluation day before the Lord Jesus Christ, our good is going to go through the fire. Work. The Bible calls it ergon, work. doesn't call it hemartiology. Hemartia it call, calls it work, ergon. And <clears throat> the gold, silver, and precious stones are going to be refined by the fire to come out on the other side. 
and it's going to stay for eternal, eternal reward. That's the good we did under the influence of the Spirit. But you produce some good under the influence of the flesh, the sin nature. And that's going to go through the fire as, guess what? Wood, hay, and stubble. Wood, hay, and straw. And fire loves that. So some of your resurrection bodies is going to have the eyelashes singed back. You did so much good out of fellowship and it's going to burn away. So we can produce good independent of God's plan. And this is very dangerous for the Christian who is a baby believer. Don't get busy for Jesus. Get busy studying the Word of God. Get busy learning Get busy learning how to live the Christian way of life first and then follow the leadership of the Spirit as you live the Christian way of life. And this, will, this is why I tell people, I don't want your money. I don't want to baptize you. I don't want you to join my church. What I want you to do is save America through right thinking. And you can only do that with the Word of God right up here. Sit down, shut up, and learn. That is your responsibility. It is my job to stand up here and shovel out the salt and for you to concentrate and listen and decide whether you believe it or not. You got it? So the sin nature, all good is not good. We can play right into Satan's hand if we don't watch it as believers and end up whitewashing his world in this lifetime. And uh, Satan is promoting his utopia on earth right now. I guarantee it. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. Now, next point in the sin nature. Gate one, Satan would love for you to be involved in his system. The old sin nature is the snare that gets us into the cosmic system through personal temptation. We still have free will to escape. The problem is, is a lot of times you just get used to falling into temptation and it becomes a subconscious reaction. You don't even think about it. You get mad. You turn on the news, you're mad in just two minutes. I know you. I'm not following your rim, but I know what happens. Or you see someone who is obnoxious to you. You get out of fellowship quick when you're around them. It's a trigger. You don't even have to think about it. It becomes a subconscious reaction. So you have to watch it when it comes to the sin nature. You have to identify temptations as they arise and apply the proper doctrine. We still have free will to escape. The sins of Gate 1, Cosmic 2, relate to the whole realm of hamartiology. That's study of sin. Escape from cosmic involvement results from an instant decision from a point of strength. There's only one prayer that God hears of the carnal believer. And that's the prayer of rebound. That's where you confess your personal sins to God the Father in Jesus' name and receive forgiveness and cleansing. What did the prodigal son say? I have sinned. Both salvation and rebound put the believer into the divine dinosphere. 1 John 1 4 through 10, Romans 5, 21. So the believer has the bronze labor of the church age, if you will, the washing after salvation in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. The word confess is homologeo in the Greek, it means to name, to cite, or to identify as in a courtroom scene. And that means that every believer never gets to leave the cross. 
we go back to the cross daily as the source of forgiveness and cleansing. Without Jesus' sacrifice, there would be no forgiveness. Without Jesus' sacrifice, there would be no cleansing. Without Jesus' sacrifice, there would be no approach to God. Without the sacrifice of Christ, there would be no fellowship with God. And so the sin nature is the internal agent that Satan uses in believers even to get them involved in the cosmic system. And we're going to see the hatred complex of sins when the believer gets involved in Satan's system and begins to devolve in the Christian way of life. Now we've covered gate one, the old sin nature gate. I want to go back here. I'm going to hit stop sharing. And I'm going to give you a whiteboard. What I want to do there. Let's hit whiteboard again. I'm not sure. There we go. Now, I wore my purple tie today for a reason. I am not a feminine man. But I wanted to make a point at the end of this lesson. We're studying the hatred complex of sins. And Jesus uh, tells us that love is the greatest attribute that a Christian can possess. It is the supreme Christian virtue, uh, agape love is. And there are two things I want you to remember. As a born-again believer, you are royal family. You've been born again into a new royalty, and that is Jesus Christ is our King as the King of kings and Lord of lords. We've been born again into His family. Now, as royalty, you may have to learn how to live. Remember? You may have to learn how to live as royalty. And what you'll find out is if you are royalty, there will be a lot of people who like to malign and criticize you just for being royalty as a child of God. So, the first thing you need to know is that royalty behaves with class. You are classy people. And how do you become classy? Not by money. Not, not by the accruements of wealth. Not because you live in an ivory tower. Not because you drive a ride in a limousine. None of those things make you classy. What makes the believer classy? It is having the answers for life. And that comes from the Word of God. So every one of you ought to be a classy believer. You ought to be having the answers for life and be able to apply them to your life and have wisdom. That's what the application of Bible doctrine to life experience is. So you are a classy believer because you have the answers for life. And I like that because it doesn't mean you have money. It means that you are royalty and you're using the ten problem-solving devices. And then secondly, royal family functions with distinction. And that means you are in the world, but you are not of the world. You're a pilgrim here. You're a sojourner. 
You're like Abraham who refused to build a house waiting on the promises of God to be fulfilled, looking for a future city that would be built not with hands is what the Bible says. You have a sense of your own destiny in Christ. And you know that this world, this life is just the beginning. And that time is just a drop in the bucket compared to eternity. And so you're looking forward to that day, to the kingdom of Christ and eternity future spent with the Lord. You operate with distinction. You're not of Satan's system. We're separate from the devil's world, see? We operate with distinction. Greater is the power that is in you than the one that is in the world. You see that? You function with, you are royalty. And the Bible tells you, you are royalty. Don't say you're not, you are. You're not a sinner saved by grace, you're a saint, the Bible says. And you are royalty. And royalty functions with class and distinction right in the middle of Satan's world. You see that? Amen. All right, I want to thank you for your attention and attendance this morning. I'm going to pray, and then we'll do a short roll call. Our Father God in heaven, we're delighted to be able to come together and study your word. And Father, it's my prayer that your truth would never return void, and we know it won't, and that it would find fertile soil in the minds of believers. We thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.